Chris says, hi, Rhonda. I would love to hear your thoughts or research on graying hair. And more specifically, is there anything that can be done, lifestyle, nutrition, supplements that can slow this process down? First and foremost, unfortunately, graying hair is largely, largely, largely genetic determined. So um, keep that in mind. Like you could be extremely healthy, have a great lifestyle, getting all your micronutrients, low stress, that is all going to help. But if you've got those early graying genes, if your your parents, you know, grade really early in life, it's very likely that you're, 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 you're fighting genetics there on that, on that. So keep that in mind. Um, so the loss of hair pigmentation is a hallmark of aging. It, it, it typically begins actually during a person's 20s. Uh, it, the timing and extent of graying vary, again, according to genetics and the interaction between biological factors, psychological factors is a really big one. And uh, graying hair is generally considered irreversible, but there have been some recent data that have come out that demonstrate that might not be so true, that graying is not necessarily a linear process and that some graying hair may be reversible, depending again on what's driving the graying. So if we're talking about genetic factors, it's gonna be largely irreversible. But if we're talking about external factors like stress, it may actually be reversible. So one of the primary drivers of graying hair is, is oxidative stress in the hair follicle, which damages the pigment producing region, the melanocyte uh, of the hair shaft. So oxidative stress, we've talked about this a million times. It occurs when our mitochondria inside of our cells are making energy. You know, it, it, it's an internal, it happens, there's like an internal thing that's happening and there's psychological factors biological factors that can affect it as well. So there's evidence that that um, depigmented hair has mitochondrial energy metabolic dysfunction. So um, it's really interesting because uh, there's a lot of case reports and anecdotal reports that suggest that repigmentation can occur and it can cause kind of like a bicolor hair. In other words, like the repigmentation sometimes is a different color than what the person's original hair color was, which is fascinating. So there's one um, study, I don't know, it was about a year ago or so, that we we actually um, put out in our Science Digest where, where the authors of the study collected dark, depigmented, and also bicolor hairs from about 14 young adults. Their average age was about 35. They didn't color their hair, they didn't bleach their hair, there's no chemically treated hair, nothing. They were just natural. And um, there, there, you know, some of these participants participants also completed a lot of stress assessment questionnaires on a life event calendar. And um, the, the the authors of this, the researchers, were able to overlay the hair pigmentation patterns with life events in these these partip- participants. So they found that a depigmentation and repigmentation event corresponded with moments in their in the participants lives linked to a stressful event so there was like marital discord for example so um that that was linked to when hair pigment was depicted hair depigmented so it became gray and then the repigmentation was linked again this is um the repigmentation was again uh they were able to to identify it because it was a different color of um there was a different color of of hair versus what their natural color was. Uh, And that was linked to a non-stressful event. Typically, it was when the person had gone on a vacation. So the authors concluded that there was these depigmented hairs. um, There was a depigmentation and repigmentation that was really linked to psychological stress. And um, they also measured and looked at the depigmented hairs, and they found mitochondrial dysfunction in this, you know, the the melanocytes, these cells that are producing pigmentation, suggesting that mitochondrial metabolism is involved in the graying process as well. And, um, you know, I, I would say, so you might go here and think, well, then maybe we need to, you know, do everything to improve our mitochondrial health and that, you know, that's something that we should focus on for 
preventing gray hair. And I would say like that's absolutely true. And one of the best things you can do is exercise. Exercise is one of the best things for your mitochondria. It, it doesn't have to be the zone two training. High intensity interval training is very good for mitochondria. It grows new, healthy, young mitochondria. So um, both, you know, you know whether you're whether you're doing more low to moderate intensity exercise or you're doing high intensity interval training or vigorous exercise, all of it is really good for for mitochondria and improving um, your mitochondrial health. With respect to supplements, um, alpha lipoic acid, um, ubiquinol, these are both in, antioxidants. Um, there's the there's the mito pure, which is thought to be the um, it's the urolithin A that's found in pomegranate that can clear away damaged mitochondria. Um, resveratrol has been shown to improve mitochondria. There's a lot of different uh, supplements that have been shown to improve mitochondrial function. Um, all of them, I would say, they're like not even comparable to what exercise can do. So that's the thing to focus on. But it is, you know, interesting to think that maybe some of these supplements could affect mitochondrial health. Um, you know, certainly ubiquinol um, has been shown to, um, particularly in the in the context of statins. So, you know, not a lot of research looking at graying hair, but I think, you know, you could draw some parallels and say, well, maybe there's, you know, a possibility that anything that's going to improve my mitochondria will also, you know, help with slowing the graying of hair. And certainly going on you know, vacations and and trying to lower and buffer your stress, meditation, yoga, things that can can buffer out the psychological stress are really important as well. There's also been some evidence that um, certain vitamins, particularly B vitamins, can affect premature graying of hair. So this is this is when you're really you a person has graying hair in their 20s. It's happening really early. That's been linked to like vitamin B12 deficiency, folic acid B7 deficiency as well. So um, the, those things have also been shown to reverse graying hair. But again, it's really sort of, I would say, isolated to this population of people that have severe vitamin deficiency, B12, B7, um, folic acid deficiency, and they have really, really early prematurely graying hair. Um, other than that, it's not like someone that has normal B vitamin levels of their B vitamins is going to reverse their graying hair by taking a, a B complex. Like that's not going to happen. Okay. And something I did want to men mention, um, there's no direct evidence on photobiomodulation. So this is red light laser therapy or red light therapy. It doesn't necessarily have to be laser. It could be LED um, on, on hair graying. There's no evidence on it. There is evidence looking at, first of all, vitiligo. So vitiligo is, you know, where you have depigmentation in, in melanocytes and skin cells. So there's a study involving 30 people that had sort of segmental type vitiligo. So it's either on their head or their neck. And um, photobiomodulation was able to repigment, uh, improve their repigmentation in about 60% of these people with successive treatments. And so, so the reason I thought it was interesting was because photobiomodulation has been shown to affect also regrowing of the hair. And um, on we, we have a photobiomodulation pay, topic page that we're about to be posting. And so that's going to go live and you guys will have all this information. Uh, but the, the parameters are really important for regrowing the hair. So the wavelength for regrowing hair was 655 nanometers and the irradiance was a combination of either LED or laser or and laser. And so it was about 22 milliwatts per centimeter squared for the LED and 4.6 meter uh, milliwatts per centimeter squared for the laser. And there's some commercially available devices that, um, that uh, may at least have some of those parameters. So the Hairmax laser comb and the Lexington International. And I think I'm gonna go ahead and um, I'm going to get one of, of these devices. I'm not sure if I'm going to do which one I'm going to do out of the two of those yet, but I am going to get one uh, for my husband to try out. 